from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco in for Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, tech tumbles, retailers sink stocks. This is concerns around earnings adds to Fed anxiety. We speak to a seasoned investor who sees opportunity in the drop. Plus, it's not just tech stocks. Cryptocurrencies are in the gutter this year too. And the meltdown shows no signs of easing. Then again, some coins are holding up better than others. We'll have all the details. And Elon Musk is at it again. Twitter's board says it's committed to the billionaire's original takeover deal, despite Elon's bot concerns. The Tesla CEO also using the social media platform to vent frustrations on the EV maker getting yanked from a key ESG index. All of that later this hour. We'll get to that in a moment. But first, let's get a look at markets. Pain for stocks. And the S&P 500 suffering its deepest one-day drop in almost two years. Bloomberg's Riddhika Gupta here with the latest Riddhika, consumer, retail, tech, all in the red. All in the red indeed, Ed. And this today has been nothing short of brutal when you have the S&P 500 closing down some 4%. The Nasdaq 100 being weighed down even more, down some 5%. You had those heavyweights like Apple and Amazon also down today over 5% in today's session. And really big tech not even being helped out by the fact that we did have lower yields today on that 10-year. It was down some 11 basis points, but that really not helping the market out today as we saw that flight into safety and Treasury is really getting a bit. And of course, when we talk about that risk off sentiment, we got to talk about Bitcoin, Ed, below that $30,000 right. threshold there, of course. Uh, if you actually think of Bitcoin in the May alone, down more than 20%, that collapse in stablecoin last week, not recovering those losses. But for today, at least, that pressure, that selling pressure really accelerated after those target earnings. So a miss on those analyst expectations and that profit outlook being cut to 6% from 8%. Now, this is not about sales. This is not about revenues. It was about higher freight costs. It was about higher inventory levels. All of that really weighing on the stock. And it was a similar story that we saw with Walmart. Walmart stock now down over the past two days and Target, of course, having its worst day since 1987. Now, let us flip up the board because when we talk about margins, when we talk about those coming under pressure, let's look at those Cisco earnings that we just got after the market closed. And you see that stock absolutely plunging down some 13% here. They got hit with those uh, China COVID lockdowns, those supply chain issues really coming to the forefront. They also got hit by the Russia Ukraine war and of course inflation playing a key part will that weigh on customer demand a real setback for Cisco after those earnings that stock after hours plunging some 13 percent Ed yeah Cisco a real bellwether of corporate spending our thanks to Bloomberg's Riddhika Gupta and let's stick with markets I want to bring in Mel Lagomasino she's the CEO of we family offices which has more than 14 billion dollars in assets under management Mel you've seen a lot of markets what do you make of a day like today well, I think we're going through a paradigm shift. You know, we're going through a regime change, and I think the markets are getting used to the fact that the very drivers that drove this fantastic investment environment for the last 10 years is not going to be there anymore. Uh, we're right. not going to have low inflation. We're not going to have low interest rates. We're not going to have globalization. Uh, we're not going to have, frankly, very benign geopolitical markets. So, uh, so I think that a lot of the things that led to wonderful markets over the last 10 years are going to change. And so I think the market is trying to figure out what's the new paradigm going to look like? What's it going to be in the next 10? We're looking at a chart on the Bloomberg terminal of valuations on the Nasdaq 100. We're getting nearer to a 10-year average on that price to projected profit, right? And we're getting nearer to pre-pandemic levels. Do you sense opportunity in a, a day like today? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I think a lot of the things that are worrying the corporates, a lot of the supply chain issues, uh, lower profit margins, inflation, et cetera, how are you going to solve it? You're going to solve it through technology. So I, I think that the, the name of the game is going to be productivity. And what's going to drive productivity? It's going to be technology. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity that's happening right now. Mel, you're the former CEO of JP Morgan Private Bank. You've been in the markets a long time. 
And there's a lot to take on board. Inflation, the outlook for higher rates, supply chain issues, China. I can go on and on if you'd like me to. What's driving the psychology of this market? I think it's inflation. I, I think it's, it's really the fact that for those of us who remember, and I do remember, once inflation starts, it's really hard to get it under control. And we really have been blessed with this unbelievable investment climate over the next 10 years, over the last 10 years. And I think people are trying to figure out how we're going to be able to bring down inflation. What is it going to look like over the next 10 years? What is it going to take? And again, I'm not a trader. I'm more of a long-term investor. So I really look right. at the next 10 years. A few things caught my eye when you and I were talking the markets throughout the day. You see opportunities in particular sectors and subsectors, talking about artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, some perhaps of those long, longer duration software stocks. Where do you see that opportunity specifically? Well, we see the opportunity around all of the sites. If you think about all of the areas that productivity is really going to change the new paradigm. Uh, it's, it's really going to be, for example, let's take the healthcare sector, take a look at the demographics of the United States. Technology, I think, is going to make a huge difference in the healthcare. And I think you have to play it across the equity spectrum. You have to play it in venture, you have to play, play it in growth, you have to play it in the private markets and the public markets. So you have to play it across the board. Same thing with cybersecurity, same thing with artificial intelligence right. or the cloud. Right. I just want to come back to Cisco. We're down 30 percent in after hours. Cisco executives saying it's impossible to catch up on supply given the current situation. You think about their exposures, what we see in the semiconductor space, their exposure to China. But you again see opportunity in semiconductors. Talk to me about that. Well, we do see a lot of opportunity in semiconductors, but it's going to take time because I think new factories are going to have to be built. Uh, there's going to be tremendous demand, but we're going through this adjustment. And I think that's where the issue is, is that we're going through this adjustment and it's taking down a lot of great companies that will, I think, emerge stronger as a result of this. They'll emerge differently as a result of this. And there will be, I think, tremendous opportunity in that space, including with companies like Cisco. We've seen this underperformance of the NASDAQ 100 relative to the broader market, right? The sensitivity of tech to higher rates, the psychology around that. Going forward, what is the key data that we're looking at? Do we track inflation or do we assess the market's faith that the Fed can handle inflation without causing a, soft, a hard landing or indeed delivering a soft landing? Well, the economy is really moving, uh, is pretty hot right now and it's going to take a bit to cool it down. So I, I think that, uh, and the consumer is still spending, even, even though you're seeing the Walmart and, and, and Target uh, results. But I, I think that the economy is probably strong enough not to have a recession this year. But I think we might get a recession right. next year. But I don't think right. it'll be long. Right. Mel, final question. You also see opportunity in private markets. Talk to me about that. We see lots more opportunity actually in private markets than in public markets. And I think there's a tremendous amount of money to be put to work. And I think that exactly what's happening in the public markets will bring down valuations and will create fantastic opportunities uh, in the private markets across the whole spectrum. The whole spectrum, indeed. Mel Lagomassino, CEO of We Family Offices, thank you. Thanks. What a fascinating thank markets you. conversation on a big day. Coming up, he might not look like the terms of the deal, but Elon Musk's Twitter takeover appears to be very much on track. The latest and all that next. Plus, Bloomberg's John Authors joins me to talk about this latest market drop and why he's warning against buying the dip. This is Bloomberg. As Elon Musk continues to tweet and tweet and tweet his concerns about Twitter's bot problems, sources say his deal to buy the platform is still very much going forward. For more on where things stand, I'm joined by Bloomberg's deals reporter, Michelle Davis, along with Bloomberg Technology executive editor, Tom Giles. And Tom, I'm going to start with you. Just bring us up to speed. Where do we stand with this? What are Twitter saying in all of this? Yeah, well, Twitter, Twitter thinks the deal's going forward. 
Um, as our colleague Michelle, who we're about to talk to, right. broke the news yesterday, Twitter's board came out and said, we're gonna enforce this merger agreement. We've got an agreement in place where Elon Musk is gonna pay 5420 for our company. Right. And we expect that deal to go through. So all this talk, all this background noise about bots and the deals on hold, which ain't a thing, right. by the way. Not a thing. Twitter's like, the deal goes forward. All right, so Michelle, I want to get the inside scoop from you. But first, we had Natasha Lamb from Arjuna Capital on the show on Tuesday. Listen to what she had to say about this whole situation. I think Twitter has had so many challenges over the years, which is why you've seen, you know, CEOs come and go, move around, why you're seeing what's happening with Elon Musk right now. Um, you know, unfortunately right now, I feel like, I feel like Elon Musk is like a, a cat playing with a, a ball yeah. of string. A cat with a ball of string. But what you're hearing, Michelle, is in the background, the bankers, the advisors, business as usual. Yeah, everyone uh, that I've been talking to, um, you know, seems to have the impression that things, this deal will proceed as planned. Uh, one big sign of that is that the proxy filing hit yesterday morning. That's, you know, this big, more than 100 page long document that explains how the deal came together. Um, it's something that was put together in coordination between the Musk camp and the Twitter camp. And it's something that Musk would have had to personally sign off on before it would have been filed. And this is a, a proxy that, you know, outlined the deal terms at 5420. So that's the clearest indication that, you know, both sides do see this deal going forward despite the, you know, tweets that we're seeing uh, on Twitter. Michelle, I've got a question. So all this chatter, all this noise in the background about bots and whether or not uh, he had all the information he needed before he agreed to this deal, what happens if he decides, I don't want to pay 5420, what are the means that he has at his disposal? So, you know, a lot of people have talked about the fact that the, the deal has a, a breakup fee and that, you know, people say that he could just pay this billion dollar breakup fee and walk away. That's not true. Um, this deal actually includes, a, it's, it's seller friendly, so it includes this legal provision called specific performance, which basically means if Musk decides he wants to walk away, Twitter can take him to court and get a court order that says you have to complete this deal, you have to come up with the financing and you have to pay for Twitter. Um, other options that he could take is he could try to show that there was something called a material adverse event. Um, it's a right. MAC clause. And he could say, you know, there was like some change to the business that materially for a sustained period of time is going to change Twitter's outlook. Um, but the burden of proof is on him. He would have to show this. So him saying, uh, you know, Twitter, I'm not going through with this deal until you prove to me that bots make up fewer than 5% of accounts. That's not, right. tw Twitter doesn't have to prove anything. Um, the other thing is he waived his right to due diligence when he was going about this deal and presented that as something that, uh, you know, was a, a vote in favor of the deal. He said, you know, I'm someone who's going to be able to do this quickly. I, I won't even do diligence. And so kind of doesn't have a leg to stand on. And then finally, Twitter has made public disclosures about the fact that, uh, you know, it estimates that the bots make up fewer than 5% of accounts, but it's also in securities filings said, including in its, you know, most recent 10K said the number could be higher than that. So it, right. it for the people I talked to say that it would be, a, a judge would be hard pressed to agree with Musk on this. Um, what could right. happen is, you know, he could walk, he could try to walk away. Uh, Twitter could take him to court um, and then, in order to avoid some, you know, lengthy protracted court battle, um, there could be a scenario where the two right. come to some settlement. But at this point, um, from my understanding, you know, Twitter does not have any reason to renegotiate a deal. The the contract is in their favor, um, and so it seems like the deal has to go ahead unless unless Musk can prove that there is some, uh, right. you know, material adverse effect to the business. Me meantime, Tom, we're zeroed in on the share price, right? You know, we, we saw the sell-off in Twitter stock accelerate with the broader market, but basically there's skepticism from the market that 54.20 cents materializes. Meantime, Elon Musk is tweeting a lot about his political affiliations. Yep. yep. And we wonder, is this him getting ahead of scrutiny of a deal? Is this him trying to get allies 
in D.C. What's your read? Sure, there's a couple things going on. He talked about his disillusionment with the Democrats, how in the next election he's voting Republican. And this is apparently the first time he's done it. I haven't seen his voting records, but that's what he's saying. So what's interesting about that, you have a couple dynamics going on. This is a guy whose market is moving, is shifting. He, he, this started in California, his company started in California, he's moved it to Texas, he's shifting toward wanting to sell trucks. He's got a different constituency. The market for electronic vehicles in California anyway is saturated. He needs to embrace a whole new constituency. People who drive trucks, different constituency than the Californians who are buying EVs. Right. So that's one side of the equation. The other side of the equation is, as you pointed out, there's a lot of scrutiny around this deal, and there's a lot of scrutiny around uh, around Tesla and his, and his management of Tesla, whether it's NHTSA, whether it's the SEC looking at things he's tweeted about sales of Tesla stock, and reportedly the, the SEC is looking into the timing of his disclosure around the uh, the Twitter stake. Right. So the government is already scrutinizing a lot about Elon Musk right. and what he says and potential uh, manipulation of securities. And so this could be him just getting ahead of it and saying, look, I told you so. Well, we knew this was already happening. We didn't need Elon to tell us. SEC, NHTSA, these agencies have already been doing it for months. Michelle, very quickly, five seconds. What's the probability of this deal happening? I couldn't tell you. <laughs> Tom? At 54.20, I don't think it happens. I think there's some kind of negotiation, just like Michelle was talking about. They go to court, he negotiates right. the price down. All right. Wait and see. Bloomberg's Michelle Davis and Tom Giles, executive editor for Bloomberg Technology. Thanks to you both. Coming up, we dig deep in today's market sell-off as investors assess the impact of higher prices on earnings and economic growth. This is Bloomberg. Let's get straight back to the sell-off in financial markets. All corners of the equities market sold off Wednesday with tech among the worst performing sectors. Joining us to digest the drop is Bloomberg senior editor for markets and opinion columnist John Authors. John, on a Wednesday like this, when you see the red across the Bloomberg mm. terminal, where do you look for answers? Huh. Well, first of all, this is one of those days which has gone back to the kind of synchronization we saw in 07 and 08. So if you look at uh, how bond yields have moved and how the oil price have moved today, both rose until about 8, 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, tested um, new levels, decided they weren't going there, and slid the rest of the day. And basically, stocks have fallen in line with the oil price and with bond yields all day. It's a very coherent bet, actually against inflation, a, a bet that and this ties back into target, although it has a huge impact on uh, the whole of the, the tech sector, uh, it ties into this belief that right. uh, inflation might be bitten off by uh, companies having to, uh, right. uh, having to swallow, swallow it with bad margins, tighter right. margins. These are big declines, and you wrote this fantastic column on Tuesday mm. about the dangers of buying the dip. You basically talk about how fund managers, investors, they're sanguine about stagflation or persistent inflation. Mm. You, you, you look at the outlook for rates, but all of these players, they're underweight tech, and tech's most sensitive to rates. Walk me through that one. Um, th it's certainly true that in the environment of the last few years, tech has been very sensitive to rates. At the moment, when uh, it's more of a, a straightforward play of, am I comfortable being in stocks or bonds? Do I think there's going to be uh, inflation uh, and stagflation or recession. At this point, I think you need to get back to the Willie Sutton um, dictum, who was, you know, when he was asked why he robbed banks, he said, because that's where the money is. <laughs> if you want to take profits at the moment, if you want to get out of uh, the uh, equity market, then the most liquid stocks in which people are probably sitting on profit still are the big right. tech fang stocks. So that's the main reason they're down. 
Yeah, come with me into my Bloomberg terminal, take a look at this chart. We've talked about the pain in certain pockets mm. of this market. ARK Innovation ETF being one, seen big declines. At the same time, we've seen five straight weeks of flows. OK, a little drop off in that. Yes. Still, what is the psychology here? What is driving that? I fear it's a lottery ticket vibe of uh, you might as well shoot for the moon. You, might as, you, you don't have much money anyway. The only way it's really going to make a difference for you is if you buy something that's really going to, to rip higher. Um, ARK has had a lot of publicity. Uh, and also people like to invest in something that's a little exciting, uh, which obviously the ARK stocks are, whereas the likes of Target and, and Walmart right. aren't. So, uh, but I think that's a disconnect between the retail market and the broader institutions who are mostly behind what's been going on today. John, when I was a kid, I was obsessed yeah. with dinosaurs. And as you know, I'm a Londoner. I used to go right. to the Natural History Museum, look at the skeletons. Right. Going across the Bloomberg terminal, I go under your bio and I see the word brontosaurus. <laughs> what are you talking about? Right. Talk to me about a brontosaurus moment. OK, well, I, I was also a fan of Dippy the Diplodocus in the, in the main hall at the Natural History Museum in London. As Love it. So, so, uh, uh, in the brontosaurus, it's a reference to yet another British guy, Jeremy Grantham who in 07, um, as, as uh, uh, the housing market had already turned and subprime um, mortgage dealers were beginning to go bankrupt, uh, was, I, I, I asked him why is the stock market still holding up so much and he said that the stock market is basically like a brontosaurus. A brontosaurus, if you bit its tail, its nervous system, its brain was so limited that it would take a long time to know that its tail had been bitten, to feel the pain. Uh, and in the same way, he said that the stock market takes an extremely long time to cotton on to what is happening right. elsewhere in the economy, elsewhere in the markets. You know, I've always wanted to do that. Talk about dinosaurs in financial markets. Yeah. You've made my day. Look. Uh, Bloomberg Opinion columnist John Authors. This is just a snapshot in time, but just incredible markets we're seeing. Thank you very much for your time. Coming up, we continue our coverage of this market volatility. U.S. stocks tumbling as investors assess the impact of higher prices on earnings, future Fed rate hikes. Have we seen this before? That's a big question with our next guest. We'll discuss that all next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Shares of retailers plunged on Wednesday, leading the sell-off on Wall Street after U.S. retail giants cut their growth outlooks for 2022. Bloomberg's Ritika Gupta joins with the latest. Which names are we watching? Well, Ed, yesterday it was Walmart. Today it was Target actually having its worst day since 1987. It was a miss on those earnings and actually cutting their profit outlook to 6% from 8%. This was not about sales. It was about those higher freight costs, higher fuel costs, and also those inventory levels rising, actually up some 43% from a year ago. That was a similar story that we saw from Walmart yesterday, which is also down in the session today. But this is not just your traditional retailers that are being hit today. That is extended over to some of your e-commerce stocks. I'm looking at Etsy. I'm looking at Wayfair. I'm looking at eBay. All of those were down today. They suffer some a lot of the same problems problems, supply chain issues, inflation, those stocks actually on a year-to-date basis getting hit even harder than the likes of Walmart, than the likes of Target. But you've got to remember when we talk about these e-commerce stocks, these were actually your pandemic darlings. But that, of course, started to falter when we got that reopening, that stay at home began to suffer as people got back out there and started shopping back in their brick and mortar. And if you actually look at the Selective E-Commerce Index, it's actually given up about half of the peak of the pandemic uh, gains. And of course, um, when we talk about sh 
with shoppers changing is not just uh, how they shop, but also what they have been shopping on. And we see that really by consumer discretionary really getting hit. Those stocks down in the past month in a big way. A key part of that, of course, is inflation. Yes, wages are rising, but they are not keeping a pace. So we're seeing a lot of that optional spending really dwindling, particularly as food and fuel prices have been rising in a big way. And that is a key theme that we have seen in some of these retail earnings, Ed. All right, Ritika, so smart on that retail beat. Thank you very much. Let's stick with the market sell-off. Lots of big-name tech companies whose stocks soared, as Ritika said, in the pandemic era of feeling the burn of higher interest rates, the continued crisis of a war in Ukraine, domestic inflation, and a pandemic now well into its third year. Let's talk about how all this market chaos is affecting not just public markets, but later-stage startups and companies with Lightspeed venture partner Alex Tausig. Alex, on a day like this, red everywhere, anxiety everywhere. What's your take on it? Well, thanks for having me, first of all, Ed. I appreciate it. Um, definitely a tough day for public market investors. Um, you know, as a, a venture capital firm um, with over 20 years of investing history in the private markets, uh, you know, we, we have a little bit of a different perspective. Our companies generally don't have the, uh, the pleasure of being marked every single day, they can take a little bit of a longer term view. So essentially, a lot of these companies raised money in 2021 at, you know, capital is fairly cheap historically and at fairly high prices. And, you know, our, our perspective is a lot of those companies are going to come back into the market in the next couple of years and not face the same kind of cheap capital environment. And so we're sort of expecting that what the public companies are seeing right now is going to trickle back down into the privates over time. But there's a lot private companies can do in the intervening period to make their businesses a lot more attractive so that when they do have to access right. the finance markets, they'll look a lot better. You have the experience, of course, of looking to your portfolio. Some of those companies in the past have gone public, of course. Come with me into my Bloomberg terminal, we'll take a look at this chart. You want to make a key point, which is that perhaps we've seen this before, right? What we're seeing on our screen is that there is a single metric that shows the magnitude of the current downturn that we're seeing. And that's a retreat in revenue multiples for a specific corner of the technology market. Left hand of your screen, the blue line, Amazon, back in 1998 through 2000, 2001, right hand side, Shopify. Why are you looking at this data? We are always looking at the public market multiples that apply to revenue as essentially we invest in growth assets that aren't usually profitable. And so the rate of growth of the business is very important and the expectation of future growth is very important. And I think in the, in the, in the days where you have ascendancies of new platforms, there's a lot of enthusiasm around the new thing. And um, you know, that can often create speculative asset bubbles, which is sort of something that's common throughout financial markets. And um, some of what's happened in the last few years uh, in addition to being, you know, pushed on by the pandemic, we feel like are parallel to what happened in the dot-com bubble with certain names that really benefited from the shift to e-commerce. Right. But you know, the the other thing to just consider here is that Amazon's still around and it's in its very very valuable company, uh, and it saw its way through a 96% share price collapse post the dot-com bubble. And uh, not to say Shopify is going to continue to go down. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. But we also believe that's a very durable business. So the chart, right. it sort of tells a few different stories at the same time. We personally take a view of optimism and that, you know, these speculative bubbles come and go. But some of these businesses are building real value for the long term. Right. You were looking on our screen, some of the, the pain in technology shares over the last seven days or so, the likes of Apple, some of those mega caps like Microsoft. I am fascinated with the private markets. We broke a story on Tuesday that SpaceX is raising more money at a valuation of $125 billion. It was valued at around $100 billion in October. When you hear about that, how do you assess valuations right now and what do valuations look like in the coming months, especially with the backdrop of a Fed that looks determined to, to raise rates? We, this is a conversation we have a lot in, internally and with some of our peers at other firms. You know, there is a big valuation reset that's essentially happening right now um, not as in the public, because again, these are not publicly traded securities, but uh, the, the, the private markets always look to the public markets for some sort of guidance on valuation. And so, you know, essentially for a lot of businesses, your multiple has been cut in half, maybe cut by 3x over the last six months. And so those businesses are essentially going to have to get back to par before they go out and raise again in this environment. And so we're really stressing the importance 
of cash flow and becoming default alive in this environment, which essentially means that you can ratchet up and down your sales and marketing spend and maintain a relatively modest burn while the volatility continues to play out. And, and we certainly expect the volatility to right. probably increase before it decreases again. Right. Very quickly, Alex, what I'm seeing on my screen is the share performance of names like Airbnb, Snap, Uber, Uber over the last couple of years. But these are names that were created in periods of stress. I am thinking back to 2008, 2009 and the financial crisis. Very quickly, what would your advice be to a founder right now with the markets as they are? Absolutely. I, the, the, fir the first thing is to stay optimistic. So while it might be a little bit difficult to do if you're looking at your own personal stock portfolio, the reality is that a downturn in a capital constrained environment often produces some of the best companies. Companies can really focus in on what they're great at and ignore things that are extraneous. Uh, talent tends to stick around longer and people are kind of uh, not choosing between as many different jobs so you can keep them engaged for longer. Right. You can really have the time to really hone that business model because you have to, to survive. So we, we invest in all cycles consistently. We've been doing it for over 20 years. And right. I, I do think that there's also some advantages that companies can have during a downturn, but that's presuming that you can get control of your business and do it decisively. Right, Lightspeed Venture Partner, Alex Tausig, giving us the private market's take on volatility. Thank you very much. Coming up, a Bloomberg scoop, Gabe Pl Plotkin, is telling investors he plans to wind down his Melvin Capital Management after billions of dollars of losses. Details ahead, this is Bloomberg. Time for our crypto report. And it's been a brutal market sell-off in digital currencies. Bloomberg's Shanali Basak with us. But before we get into digital assets, I have to ask you about Melvin Capital Management's plan to wind down. Yeah, truly, Ed. Remember, this is an amazing scoop by Bloomberg's Hama Parmar. Gabe Plotkin, really the poster child here of that GameStop short squeeze, even after recouping some of the losses that he had in early 2021, is now down again for the year and telling investors that he is returning money and winding down funds. Remember, this is right after he initially tried to reboot the fund in a different fashion, scrap those plans. And now, remember, I've got to say, uh, Wall Street for a while now has been expecting some casualties in the hedge fund industry and it starts here with melvin capital all right shanali keep Give me a quick update on the markets and in the world of cryptocurrencies as well. Yeah, absolutely. Something interesting here, Ed, is that even though you saw that brutal sell-off today in the market more largely, especially in the NASDAQ 100 with a 5% sell-off, you're actually seeing Bitcoin, even though it's trading below that 30% level, only falling about 3% over, over a 24-hour period. So not selling off as steeply as the market. You are seeing it also hold steady as opposed to other coins, uh, altcoins in this downturn. So when you look at Bitcoin, to what extent is it the relative safe haven compared to the other crypto assets? All right. Thanks, Shanali. Stay with us. Let's bring in our next guest, Hani Rushwan, who's the co-founder and CEO of 21 Shares, a crypto exchange traded products issuer that's been making waves in Europe for the past four years. And it's now marking its U.S. entrance with the launch of two new funds. Simple question to start with, Hani. Why is the U.S. OK with ETPs? but not ETFs. So thank you for having me. I'm really excited to um, talk about our launch into the U.S. market. Uh, we're launching private funds today, so we're not yet launching ETFs or ETPs. Uh, we uh, are working on an ETF in America, and, and that's public as well, uh, but nothing has been announced yet on that. We're still working very, very closely with the regulators on all of that. Why is it that this is the time to launch new products in a down market, especially when there's a lot of questions about how comfortable institutions will get with these types of products in such a downturn? So there are a couple of reasons. Uh, when we first launched in 2018, the world's first physically backed uh, ETP, which was the first crypto ETF uh, on the Swiss stock exchange, it was a bear market. And uh, I remember that uh, the initial seed capital of five million went down to three and a half two days later. It turns out that building during bear markets, if you're focused on the long term, uh, ends up being a pretty good bet. Uh, the other way of looking at this is um, 
nothing fundamental has changed with any of the underlying technologies. And we're seeing this uh, across the board, both across every crypto asset, as well as more institutional investor interest. One of the things that should be very, very comforting is that despite the market sell-off and what happened with the Terra ecosystem last week, we only saw a couple of days of outflows. Uh, and we've seen consistent uh, inflows today, yesterday, the day before, and Friday as well. While you're on it, how does what happened last week, I guess more than a week ago now, the Terra breakdown really draw into question the broader crypto ecosystem and the place of other coins, <laughs> stable coins uh, in the ecosystem? So we had um, the world's largest uh, Luna, Terra ETF, um, which was listed in, on the uh, European exchanges, including Switzerland. So we've been following this very, very closely. Um, on the product itself, uh, considering that uh, Luna is now operating intermittently, we've obviously suspended uh, quoting the products. Uh, however, there seems to be a potential rescue plan, and we'll keep that up and running while we monitor that. I think it's important to just take a step back and really look at Terra as what it was, which was a grand experiment that was supported by some of the world's largest and no most notable investors, both in the crypto space and in the traditional financial space, to try and build an algorithmic stablecoin. Um, had they succeeded, which obviously they did not, it would have had huge positive ripple effects. And so it was a worthy experiment to run that built a vibrant ecosystem uh, with a lot of risks. And our research right. has shown that uh, the risks were uh, there as well as the opportunity. Honey, we see on our screens you're in Florence, Italy. Lovely. That's a wonderful place. In the heartland of the European Union, talk to me about the regulatory landscape, the difference between doing business in Europe versus the US, your experience of launching these products in each market? It's different um, geography by geography. What regulators are looking for and what populations are looking for uh, can be different. We just launched uh, Australia's first Bitcoin and Ethereum ETFs, and that was uh, due to answering very, very different questions than we have in Europe, both in the EU and in Switzerland, uh, where we are active. Uh, Switzerland jumped uh, ahead of the pack by trying to uh, create a crypto nation. And so we've been very, very supported uh, from the beginning out of our Zurich base. But as the asset class is, has become too big to ignore, other regulators around the continent and, and actually around the world uh, have started to pay attention and have had incredibly engaging conversations with us. You know, I think it's really interesting that you had been working on uh, ETPs outside of Bitcoin. There are so many uh, calls for ETFs when it comes to Bitcoin itself. But when you look at what happened with Luna and the need to halt the product, what has it taught you about products that are tied to other types of assets here in the crypto universe that have a lot more risk potentially? So one of the beautiful things about crypto is that everything is open source, including the smart contracts, including the risks that, that are applied to whatever ecosystem you might be investing in. Uh, and like I said, uh, our research very adequately uh, on Luna uh, displayed both the risks and the potential uh, rewards. It's, um, it's going to be different investing in the alts versus Bitcoin and Ethereum. And again, this was a grand and I, I, right. I believe, very noteworthy experiment to run. Right. Our thanks to Hani Rashwan there, co-founder and CEO of 21 Shares. And of course, my good mate, Shanali Basak over in New York. Coming up, an ESG exit for Tesla. Why the EV maker lost its spot in the S&P 500 ESG index and what the world's richest man has to say about it. That's next. And we're also looking at shares of Cisco in after hours down 12.7 percent the company talking about struggles with the supply chain china the war in ukraine are ultimately cutting its sales forecasts for 2022 a stock we'll keep an eye on as the markets go by this is bloomberg
in this week's Technomics. Shares of Tesla's dropping on Wednesday. And EV maker also lost its spot on the ESG version of the S&P 500 index. The indices provider citing working conditions and crashes for Tesla's score on environmental, social and governance standards. Elon Musk reacting to the news, tweeting, quote, Exxon is rated top 10 best in the world for environmental, social and government ESG by S&P 500, while Tesla didn't make the list. ESG is a scam. It has been weaponized by phony social justice warriors. All Elon Musk's words, not mine. Joining us to discuss all of this, Bloomberg's Dana Hole, who leads coverage not just of everything Tesla, but everything Elon Musk as well. In all that noise, tell us what the news was there. Well, I think it's pretty clear that Elon Musk knew that this was coming. He has right. been raising concerns about ESG rating systems for several weeks now, and he does have a point. I mean, what are the metrics and why are they always changing? And for passive investors, ESG ranks, rankings are very important. But he would argue, you know, we make electric cars. How can we be ranked less than an oil company? Right. And we have to remind ourselves, of course, the mission statement of Tesla is to advance the transition to sustainable energy. I mean, what is Tesla's impact on the world? Give, bring, bring us back to basics. We assume everyone knows what the company does and how it's trying to help. But what does Tesla do? So Tesla makes electric cars. They also make energy products, solar roof, batteries. They have big utility contracts. But they have been dinged quite a bit reputationally by uh, workforce issues at the Fremont plant. They have been sued by the state of California for blatant racism against black workers. Right. The EEOC is investigating them. Um, and so, I mean, there, there are some problems there. And the, the board of directors has been dinged quite a bit for overlapping uh, duties and, um, you know, they've been under pressure to diversify their board, which they have done. I'm just looking at Tesla's stock year to date on the Bloomberg, down more than 30 percent, caught up in Wednesday's sell off, as all stocks were. What's the story for Tesla right now? Because we're so focused on Elon Musk's tweet by tweet analysis of what's happening with the Twitter deal. I feel like we're not really talking about Tesla. Well, I think what's really happening at Tesla is production in China. I mean, the production in China really took a hit when the factory in Shanghai was shut right. down for almost a month because of COVID. Now they're bringing that back online. But, you know, there's still supply chain issues. And it's going to be a hard quarter for them. Uh, there's all this macro stuff. They still hold Bitcoin. Bitcoin has seen a rough ride of late. Um, and there's not really any new product launches on the horizon. So Musk said that there's going to be an AI day in you know August. So what what are we going right. to see there? Like the new Tesla bot, more talk about JoJo, like more promises about self-driving. But I mean, this is like a weird year for them. They don't have a new product that they're bringing to market. So for our audience out there, Dana writes a fantastic, if I say so myself, column for Hyperdrive, where you basically take a step back, talk about what's going on in the world of EVs and Tesla. And Wednesday's column is about insurance. Yeah. What's Tesla doing in the world of insurance? Well, this is a big passion project of the CFO, Zach Kirkhorn. And, you know, Tesla very shrewdly, I think, is trying to find new revenue streams. They always say that they are a software company, not just a car company. And they really want to have, like, a captive audience with their customers. Um, you know, you buy a car, then you get the solar roof, then you get the power wall. Well, you might as well buy Tesla insurance, too. And because Tesla has so much data on your vehicle and how you drive it, they can really kind of monetize that, but also offer you a premium based on your driving skills. Um, you know, other insurance companies have tried to do this, right. but Tesla customers, particularly who live in Texas, have said that they really like it and that their premiums are cheaper. Very quickly, we've just got a few seconds. What's the next thing to look for in the Tesla calendar? Put you on the spot a in little the, bit. In the Tesla calendar, we will have uh, second quarter delivery figures in early July. Right. We will have an annual meeting August 4th. All right, our thanks to Bloomberg's Donna Hole, Elon Musk, reporter in chief. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We're back tomorrow where we'll continue to follow the S&P 500's biggest drop in almost two years and the broader implications, including for tech. And don't forget to tune in to Bloomberg Studio 1.0 at 9.30 p.m. New York time. Emily Chang speaks exclusively with Roblox CEO and co-founder David Bazuki about the online gaming platform's explosive growth and cultivating a civil digital community while exploring new revenue opportunities. That's tonight and this is Bloomberg.